Joey. He's a fucking retard and just stop posting lies and shit on the internet. You need to stop that. I'm not a gay black Jew. Hey man, sometimes you just gotta drop some truth bombs on people, you know what I'm saying? You can't have people going around thinking you're a gay black Jew. <laughs> Right, sorry. Don't want to get us canceled. Anyways, on episode 192 of this fine program, we're going to be doing something a little bit different because instead of covering a specific band, we are going to be covering the uh, musical work of several bands all featuring the same guy. That guy being La Sepuka or La Se, uh, Bico, as I was calling him for fucking years because I can't pronounce Finnish names for shit. <laughs> And if you're going to talk about Lhasa and his contributions to uh, death metal and metal in general, you are going to have to start off with his most famous band, Hooded Menace. And if you're going to talk about Hooded Menace, you got to talk about Tombs of the Blind Dead, Night of the Seagulls, Ghost Galleons, all of the Blind Dead movies. If you don't know what those are, it's really wacky, spooky, slow-moving horror cinema from uh, Spain in the 70s. So picture this. You know those, like, Knights Templars guys, right? So they're going around doing fucking whatever. It turns out they're actually Satanists, and they're, like, doing some kind of fucked-up necromano rites and shit. And then they get captured by, you know, the townsfolk or the Catholic Church or whatever. They tie them up to something and then, like, kind of kill them of exposure and the birds specifically the seagulls come and like eat out their eyeballs but then because they're like weird spooky satanist types hundreds of years later they come back from the dead and they kind of just run around being spooky and killing people and shit it's pretty fucking dank what but the reason all of that is important for the band hooded menace is because they were on razorback records back in the day now i've talked about razorback a couple times specifically on my uh, acid witch episode and uh, the episode about crypticus razorback was a pretty cool label i think they're still around and their whole deal was all the bands on their label kind of had sort of like a concept gimmick type thing to them so like crypticus was all based on sort of like this kind of literary horror hp lovecraft like spooky stuff decrepitaph was like very 1980s satanic panic weird cult shit acid witch was obviously all about fucking witches fondle corpse was all about like critters and ghoulies and gremlins you know you got like little monsters running around fucking killing people and hooded menace was all about those tombs of the blind dead movies but what made razorback cool was like they were putting this stuff out in the early 2000s early to like mid aughts i guess when uh i just kind of figured death metal was dead and then i found out oh there's actually all these like great bands and razorback and then other labels like dark descent were a big part of putting out stuff that was cool like that and i didn't have the hindsight of uh, knowing that within five years or so the retro death thing would become just as um cringe as the uh, tech death boom of like the late 90s and early 2000s that's besides the point most of these bands ended up leaving razorback it was sort of like a be uh, breeding ground for bands who would then later on kind of go on to do their own thing often shedding a lot of the more conceptual elements and that's where we start with hooded menace is on their first album on razorback fulfill the curse which was a major revelation for me you know as a younger metalhead because these guys played Doom Death and uh, Osfix, even back then, was one of my favorite bands, so I was obviously excited to hear that. They actually weren't, like, the first band to play metal songs about the Blind Dead series. Probably the most famous example of someone doing that before Hooded Menace would be Cathedral, who actually are a pretty big influence on Hooded Menace, but only on their early stuff. Like, Hooded Menace, if you were to compare them to Cathedral at all, they only really sound like their first album and their demos, whereas they didn't start singing Tombs of the Blind Dead shit until way later in their career when they were like... Yeah, uh, could we not get it on? Because I didn't care for that shit at all. And it didn't really match the atmosphere of the uh, lyrical topics they were singing about, if you ask me. Other bands like Moss and uh, Razorback label mates, Machetazo, did much more fitting music about the Blind Dead series. But they both sounded very different from Hooded Menace. Hooded Menace definitely had their own thing going on. They had a much more serious approach to their music. And I think that fits like what those movies were trying to convey as opposed to them actually just being cheesy horror movies. And that's why I like Hooded Menace. Lots of cool like layered guitar parts like this one. The cool thing about Hooded Menace is that much like label mates Acid Witch who are kind of turning 
Witchfinder general style doom metal into death metal. Hooded Menace with uh, some decidedly disgusting vocals is almost sort of taking like old candle mass and forcing it to become death metal with their very own unique riffing style. Like this could almost be a candle mass riff, this sort of like harmonic minor exploration, like very long winded riff. But when it's down tuned like this and it has all sort of the uh, conventional rock and roll catchiness sort of wrung out of it, it becomes its own thing entirely. That's not to say that it's all dirge like, like that song. They also get pretty, um, pretty groove oriented at points. Layered guitars on this release are very important because they'll do stuff like this where they kind of diverge off in different melodic directions and then weave themselves back together for major impact points like this one. Really nice sort of death metal chug riff that still maintains that kind of candle mass style melody just in a very desiccated rotten form. Also lots of cool little bendy parts. Heavy on rhythmic variation. There's a lot of negative space between the notes and the riffs that they hit pretty hard for a dramatic effect. This part's cool because it's kind of like old cathedral back when they were good. This thing right where they're inserting these melodic bits in between like the very simple chug riffs. That's good stuff. It's cool to see that. And it's damn catchy, but it's also completely serious. There's no goofiness and I like that. Here's some candle mass style double bass with a nice little soaring lead over it taking us out of the sample. So Fulfill the Curse was of course a great fucking album. It might be my favorite out of all of theirs, but honestly this band kind of kept going from strength to strength under a loss's direction. One of the most interesting pieces on Fulfill the Curse, the first album, was their cover of the theme from uh, Lucio Fulci's Manhattan Baby. If you know anything about those old Italian horror movies, you know they had these really cool sort of like layered melodic motifs throughout the picture that like definitely gets stuck in your head and have sort of like a classical music thing going on. You know, I think it's shit like fucking Goblin and whatnot. And I think experimenting with rendering that in a death metal form really inspired the uh, middle part of Hooded Menace's career because they started writing their own riffs in that style and it turned out really fucking good. So they leave Razorback, like most bands do eventually, and they start putting out slightly less primitive and more melodic sounding stuff. This is the first track on their third album. It is entitled Vortex Macabre and it kind of shows up what I was talking about with the increased focus on melody and greater complexity of like melodic guitar points in the style of a uh, film soundtrack. Also reminds me a lot of like Paradise Lost or even My Dying Bride or Catatonia in terms of this like kind of gothic melodicism but with most of the overwrought emotionality taken out of it in favor of just like a really macabre and gross feel which makes sense because the song's called Vortex Macabre! <laughs> Honestly, that's one of the defining characteristics of Hooded Menace's whole career is they take stuff from other bands and kind of take all the goofiness out of it, whether it be weepy gothic shit or fucking silly groovy shit. And they just make it really grim and morbid. Here's some more of that nice sort of like slow candle mass style double bass, leading into a pretty darn cool riff right here. This riff, I really want to talk about this riff. It's my favorite riff on the album and it does this. You hear that? That was neat. Check it out. They're going to do it again. This is a really cool guitar technique. That is actually a very ancient guitar technique. What he's doing there to get that wow sound is he's just barring his finger across one of the higher up frets and then hitting like all the higher strings. This actually goes all the way back to Black Sabbath. See, they were even doing this like 1971, their second album, in the middle of War Pig. It's all about that sort of guitar technique. And they kept running with it in more morbid directions on Master of Reality, the album afterwards. A little song you might have heard of called Children of the Grave, man. It's all over that one. But you might have noticed something there. It was more of a single tone as opposed to the uh, earlier iteration of the technique where you could clearly hear all of the strings being hit and this kind of became the standard way of doing this technique in doom metal for the foreseeable future where it's more of a single tone a good example of that in a later band would be on witchfinder generals r.i.p right there man and honestly, I'm not really feeling the wow. I like the wow. And uh, judging by how Witchfinder General played that same song in other releases. Oh, wow. 
They kind of felt the same way I did because they just completely left that part out. Hooded Menace evidently felt the same way about the but instead of just like leaving that shit out, they went back to how Black Sabbath originally did it where you can clearly hear all of the notes being hit. This little counterpoint riff to that part is also really nicely done. Big fan of this riff. And it leads very nicely back into them using that initial riff as the bedrock for a solo section. See, cool solo. And then here's that guitar technique being utilized right about now. So they got really heavy in doing these really sick solos. But then watch when they lead into the Giallo style like film soundtrack melodies. This part is so fucking cool. It's maybe my favorite part in the uh, Hooded Menace catalog. Doubling up on the harmony there, that's so nice. And even the riff under it, it isn't just like a throwaway, you know, this is the riff that goes under the solo part. It's a dank riff in its own right. So they're firing all cylinders in that album. And that leads us to what uh, Hooded Menace sounds like nowadays. They went even farther into that melodic direction on their newest album. Cool kind of spiritual healing style flanger effect on the guitars, that's always nice to see. And it's decidedly less doomy throughout, although it definitely does hit the doom parts. But there's quite a bit of thrash going on in Newer Hooded Menace, which is a surprising development. But it's still really nice. And the guitar parts have gotten very, very complex. Like, definitely harder to play than older Hooded Menace stuff. <laughs> and the solos are just bonkers now. Crazy levels of melodicism. This album was actually produced by uh, Andy LaRoque from King Diamond. And honestly, a lot of these solos are very Andy LaRoque sounding, but there's still plenty of this nasty sort of like doom death shit going on. And so with that, that's Hooded Menace. I know what you're thinking. Wasn't that a short ass episode? That's why you're wrong. This is not RFI episode 192 Hooded Menace. This is RFI episode 192 Lasse Pico. Lassi Pika Geo Pika Lasse Puka. And you might be thinking, dude, this guy came out of nowhere in like 2008 just doing this crazy old school style death metal. Well, he didn't come out of nowhere because he'd actually been doing death metal for a long time before that. His first band, Phlegathon, was putting shit out in like 1992. And these guys played some really weird, like very progressive rock kind of death metal. It fits right in with like Amorphous and Zisma and all those other guys, Morticus back in the early 90s. But you can almost sort of hear the roots of the Hooded Menace riffing style in some of these doomier parts. And the vocal patterns are very similar to the kind of stuff he would do in Hooded Menace as well. Also like that nice loud bass and then this part kicks ass starts getting kind of faster and more rock and rolly, but also more evil sounding. Possibly comparable to a Furball from Sweden, who are one of my favorite underrated death metal bands. So yeah, this Fresco Lungs EP, he did this, there was a whole bunch of fucking demos, some of them veered off into like weird industrial territory. Pretty good stuff. And he just kind of is going around the underground putting out these demos until he gets signed a Razorback with uh, the Hooded Menace project. But even that isn't his only work. Most notably, he did vocals on the first Acid Witch album, which is my favorite. But if you want to hear more about Acid Witch, there's like a stupid long episode I did on them from way, way back when. But he even had other bands on Razorback. A really cool one was just called Claws. What did you say, punk? Big meaty claws! And this project was of particular interest to me because I read him talking about it in an interview and he said it was influenced heavily by the old Swedish death metal band Crematory, who are one of my favorite bands that never made it out of the demo stage, not to be confused with the kind of hit or miss gothic melodic whatever project from Germany of the same name. And like that band Crematory, Claus's riffs are made up of these like modular chunks of chromatic chord progressions that all flow together very smoothly despite being very dissonant. He also incorporates a lot of that same great lead guitar that was such a big part of Hooded Menace. And it's cool to see that happening in sort of like a different, more death metal-y, less doomy content. Also really cool melodies, even though it's definitely not melodic death metal. Like this is death metal, death metal. For people that like fucking death metal. Specifically Swedish style death metal, even though he's Finnish. 
Very heavy, very catchy. I also like how snappy and weird the drums are. They almost sound like the same drum sound you'd hear in the early scene of Light, oddly enough. And there's lots of these cool, like, D-beat parts. You gotta love those. Very like, punkish sort of death metal. And it does lean into Doom, which is to be expected from a project from this guy. And it also leads into some really nasty, kind of groove-influenced death metal riffs. Like this almost sounds like the best of old Unleashed, with some really nasty dissonant lead guitar over it. Screams of the Dam. Boom! On it house! And then watch how he comes out of this, he goes into like this wacky double time bit right around now. That's good stuff. That Claws album. I wish that this project of his had done more. I think he plays everything on it, but I never hear anybody talk about it, and it's fucking great. Another project that he was involved in that also featured other members of Hooded Menace that nobody fucking talks about was the excellent sort of like weird grindcore thrash death band uh, Vacant Coffin. Being sort of like a grindcore style project, this one has even more punk influence to it than uh, Claws did. Lots of these like heavy blast beats with uh, surprisingly catchy riffs kind of peeking through now and then. Like this could almost be a misfit riff, but it's in like a grindcore song. <laughs> Not this part though, that's just straight up fucking death metal. But then he does even weirder stuff like this. Slows it down start to hear the beginning of the sort of horror soundtrack style shit that he was going to end up doing so much in Hooded Menace later on. With this nice kind of fading in lead guitar that is going to be bolstered by these heavy like one note rhythm guitar bits here. Cascading just morbid melodies. I love the one Vacant Coffin album and I wish there was more of it because it's got cool shit like this on it. What you're listening to now is the end of the song Gut Worship, and it kind of does a sort of cool fade into the beginning of the next song on the album, Raise Your Justice, with that spooky fucking like horror soundtrack type thing that I love so much. You can hear the two melodies starting to combine, and then the other one rises up. This cool like sparkling chord thing. You might accuse of that other part it sounded a little bit too light, just like that one Phantasm part in the first Entombed album. This, however, is wholly unique. I very rarely have ever heard a riff like this. It's super strange. Like, perfect way to end the album is that like, one-two punch of these two oddly melodic sort of death grind crash songs. And this is really good stuff. And then watch what this leads into. It's gonna bring back that sort of horror movie thing. But now it's being played sort of like inside out on a keyboard. It reminds me a lot of sort of like the ending of the second Atrocity album, where like album started out with this one melodic bit, and then at the end of the album they play like a weird backwards version of it on a keyboard. Really cool sort of like bringing it together full circle type thing. This Lasse guy, he has stated that he just really likes writing music. He rarely ever writes the lyrics for it. He just likes recording vocals and guitars and writing songs. Like, I think the only band he's played live with is, like, Hooded Menace and maybe Phlegathon back in the day. And in the case of Hooded Menace, that was only at, like, large festivals. He rarely ever does it. He's just a cool dude in Finland, writes a lot of cool music. And you should check it out. Uh, hopefully you like the episode about it. See ya. Ninja, vanish!